praise you, Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Good to be here to lift up his name. It's been a really busy day. Uh, just to give you an idea what kind of a day it's been, I set up for the funeral reception for tomorrow afternoon and forgot to bring plates with me. So <laughs> no, tell them what you're going to get out of this worship service tonight. Just pure, unadulterated praise. That's for Platelets. sure. That's what you're going to get. Platelets? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Can you do that again, Brother Matt? <laughs> Praise <laughs> the Lord. Let's invite his presence yeah, in this yeah. place. And as we do, let's hold up the Joiner family God, yes. for um, the circumstances of the funeral tonight and tomorrow and ask for peace for them. Lord God, we thank Hallelujah, you so much Lord for your God, faithfulness. Lord, Lord Jesus, we lift you up. Tonight, Lord God. We magnify Lord, your name. We magnify your tomorrow, word. Lord, God, Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your hearts, presence, Lord, Lord, and your guidance Lord, in our lives. Open up hearts we pray, Lord, in truth, Jesus' Lord God, name, to give them faith, to bless, Lord, Lord God, in your name, in this service Lord God. tonight. We're here to lift you up and worship you, Lord, Lord God, spirit and, and open in truth. Up hearts and minds we pray, Lord God, the hallelujah, truth, Lord your presence, God. Lord God, hallelujah to be here, Lord. Anoint our teachers, lost, Lord, Lord the message, God, Lord, anoint the messenger. Lord Lord, in Jesus' Lord, name, understand that Lord, you be with the, the joiners, real Lord, through this comforter, funeral. Lord, God, Lord that you, you would be a comforter, way, Lord God, and a peace light, giver Lord to God. them, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Help our light to shine, Jesus. Lord, to them in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Help our Thank light to shine, Jesus. Lord, in Hallelujah, Jesus' name. Lord God, to remind yes. you that our spring conference is this upcoming Saturday. There will be prayer at 1230 and the service is at 1. Brother Anthony Wilkes from the Missions America Department will be here for this service and... Um, in addition, brother and sister Traxel from that same department yeah. will also be here. Initially, he had not been thinking he was going to be able to make it, but we're, we're excited to have them come and um, just go show him some New England hospitality. Amen? Praise the Lord. Yes. Let's worship him tonight. You are here in our Just 
spend a few minutes in his presence. Lord God. Whisper his Lord, name. Hallelujah, you, Jesus. We give you, you glory, God. Lord God. Hallelujah. Though our bodies may be weary, Lord God. Yes, Hallelujah. Lord. You're our strength and our very present help, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. Yes, we give Lord. you glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Oh, 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 oh let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let it rise. The joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Oh.
let it ride. Oh, let it ride. Let it ride. of all of our praise and we magnify who you are Lord God oh we surrender our lives to you Lord Jesus Lord we lift you up Lord we lift you up we lift you up we lift you up
good God we serve. Hallelujah. Except for the grace of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Where would I be? Oh, only he knows. But thank God for his grace, his blood, his mercy. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us, Lord. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Oh, I'm, I'm so, so glad you're in my life. Aren't you glad tonight? Oh, and I'm, I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, he's worthy. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Oh, I'm so glad you're in my life. And I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises, and I'm so glad you're in my life. Oh, I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, you came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my death to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Precious drop of blood you shed for us, God. We give you glory. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Do you still remember the day he wrote your name down in glory? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. Oh, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's 
is mine. And the white robed angels sing the story. Sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven evermore to roam. There's a new name written and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, and the white robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home, there's a new day written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, with my sins forgiven I am bound for Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, give him a little bit of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You are worthy, Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. You may be seated here tonight. Thank you, musicians. Amen. I'm glad my name's written down in glory. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
You know, that happened when I got baptized. <laughs> That's part of it. Amen. When I got the Holy Ghost. Amen. Got written down in glory. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. We ask Brother Stephen to come help us receive an offering here tonight. Amen. We're thankful for what God is doing. Amen. In the midst of us. Yes. Lord God, we thank you for this time in your presence that we might seek you and learn of you. Yes, Lord. As we bring these tithes and these offerings to your storehouse, O oh God. I pray that you would bless it, that you would sanctify it, that it might be useful for work your kingdom, that this gospel message might be spread. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone said amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. You can open your Bibles here tonight to the book of Genesis chapter 4. Amen. Again, as Sister Olette already mentioned, please be in prayer tomorrow for the funeral services and memorials that are going on yesterday that God will have his way when we go do that tomorrow. Um, the Lord is going to be reaching to people that are there, people that had known Dougie, people that had seen some of the changes that God had done in his life when he was living right for the Lord. And the opportunities are going to be open for God to reach to those people. Amen. And again, be praying for our spring conference coming up. Amen. That God is going to have his way and that the Lord will op continue to open doors for us. Amen. And we thank God tonight for what he's doing. Praise God. Genesis chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 3 through 7. And we're going to talk about the beginning of worship tonight, amen, the beginning of worship found in, recorded in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, it says, verse 3, in the process of time it came to pass that came, bought, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Amen. And we know that later on that in the next verse that Cain goes out and kills Abel, and the Lord confronts him. So we have here the beginning of worship for humanity in the Bible, and we find out that Cain and Abel offer the very first sacrifices. And we know the story that the Lord accepts Abel's offering, but he doesn't accept Cain's. And this leads to Cain being so angry, the Bible says wrath, which means it's hot anger, that his outward appearance shows dejection or shame or something that is detected. You know, most likely he's angry that God accepted his younger brother, but he didn't accept him. And it's not really so much a rejection personally of Cain as what Cain has done. God allows him an opportunity to correct the situation. So we see that the Lord talks to Cain and tells him, if you offer up the proper sacrifice, you'll be accepted. Aren't you glad tonight? Amen. That You know, sometimes we need to learn how to worship God. Sometimes we start out, and it's not the way God wants us to do it. Oftentimes, if we've been raised in some denomination, we have to learn a new way of worship that we weren't used to worshiping in, and, and so we have to learn to yield to God and sometimes do things that we might have felt uncomfortable to do because our personality or because it was not accepted in the religion that we were used to being involved in. But the Lord says to Cain, he says, he says, if you offer up the proper sacrifice, you will be accepted. And then Cain, the Lord tells Cain that he's got a responsibility to resist sin and do the right thing. Sin's lying at the door. But you're supposed to have dominion over sin. You're supposed to take authority over that. And if you don't take authority, it's going to take authority over you. Amen. So Cain kills Abel, and he's sent out from the presence of 
the Lord. So now, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn in this story of worship from Cain and Abel. And I think, to me, one of the most important lessons here is we must worship in a way that's acceptable to God. Now, again, this sometimes ruffles people's feathers because oftentimes we're taught to worship a certain way, but if the way we're taught to worship does not satisfy God's way, it's not going to work, okay? And so we must worship in a way that's acceptable to the Lord, and just because we give the Lord the best we've got does not mean that God has to accept it. Okay, I think Cain gave the Lord the best that he had. Now, I hear diff you hear different opinions about that. Some think that, you know, it was his attitude. I don't think it was his attitude at this point. I think he actually gave the best that he had because the Lord doesn't say your attitude or your heart's not right. He says if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. In other words, you didn't do the right thing. Okay, so... He's asking, and now he knows what the right thing is because he sees what Abel brought and he sees that God accepted it. And so sometimes we even have difficulty because we want God to do something a certain way with us and then we see that God accepts some other person or that other person's got favor with God and we're upset because we'll have to, God might say, you got to do it their way. <laughs> Amen, and God will do that. So there's, there's no indication to me that Cain brought bad stuff. It says he brought of the fruit of the ground. To me, he just brought, he brought what he thought was the best or was good, and it's not so much that he brought good or bad, but he did not bring what God wanted him to bring. Amen. So again, the Lord says, if you do well, you're going to be accepted. And again, I'm glad tonight that if I do it, the way God wants me to do it, God is going to accept me. If you do it the Lord's way, God is going to accept you. And then often, again, the problem, the problem that so many people have is they want to do it their way. They want to do it the way they're used to. They want to do it according to their personality. But, you know, God will challenge our personalities. And really, that's part of what the Holy Ghost is for, is to raise us above our personality, so that we can be what God wants us to be. Amen. So even though I got a French-Canadian background, I don't have to be French-Canadian. I can be a Christian. Even though somebody might have an Italian background, and they might say they got hot tempers, you don't have to be bound by that. You got the Holy Ghost. God is greater than your personality. God is greater than your DNA. God is greater than your culture. Hallelujah. God is greater than your background if you'll let him be greater than your background. Amen. So Cain's attitude did not become bad, I should say, until, until when he saw that the sacrifice was rejected and Abel's accepted. That's when Cain's attitude to me seems to become bad. His pride it prevented him from accepting the Lord's admonition. Listen, look how good God was. God comes, God, God could have just said, well, just take a look at Cain. He, he could have said, you should figure that out. Look at Abel. Abel's is accepted, yours is rejected. Just think about it, Cain. Just think about it. But God actually comes to Cain and says, why are you upset? If you do the right thing, I'll accept you. Amen. So God's actually giving Cain a chance here. God is coming personally to Cain, amen, and thank God God comes to us personally to help us, amen, understand what we need to receive or do, but Cain would not receive it because he's so angry now, he's so hot under the collar that his attitude is not according to what's right or wrong or, you know, can I please God, it's that my brother was accepted and I was rejected. This is now what's the focus in his mind. And the fact that he's so focused on that shows that he's got a, a pride problem because he's more concerned about how he feels or how he looks than what God wants. 
And really, isn't that the whole purpose of worship is to bring God what, what God wants, right? Not to bring what I want, but to bring what God wants. Amen. Sometimes that's why it's difficult when you come to church. You come to church and, and you know God can be here, but sometimes you come with, with a frame of mind that you're going to give God a certain kind of praise or a certain attitude. Not necessarily a bad attitude, but you, you're expecting the service to go a certain way. And God doesn't make the service go that way. And sometimes we've got to adjust in order to give to the Lord what he is wanting from us. You know, we might come and we want, we want a wall bang in service, but God says, no, no, that's not what's happening tonight. I just want you to just worship me. I just want you to just praise me. Amen. Or I, I just want you to just pray to me tonight. I just want you to just talk to me tonight. Amen. And so we have, when we come to church, we've really got to put up our spiritual antennas to try to see what it is that God wants from us. Amen. Amen. And that, that's part of worship. It's giving the Lord what he wants from us. So his pride prevented him from accepting the Lord's admonition. His pride is the influencing factor in his actions that follow. So the Bible says in 1 John 3 and 12 that Cain was of that wicked one. Okay, we don't read any place in the scripture where the devil personally comes to Cain. But what does it mean by that? Cain has got the same attitude that Satan had. His pride. Satan's pride got him thrown out of heaven. Cain's pride is, for, is preventing him from receiving what God has got for him. So he's got the same attitude, the same spirit, if you will, that the devil had. Again, it says he's gone the way of Cain when we look in Jude 1 and 11. Well, what's, 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 when it's talking about the way of Cain, the way of Cain is, it's talking about people in the book of Jude that resist God's way. Cain was not willing to re accept God's correction and God's direction, but he's going to do what he wants to do. He's angry with Abel, so he's going to remove the thing that's making him look bad. He's going to murder Abel. So the wicked through pride, the Bible says, here's a few good scriptures that we ought to just look at because, again, this, these are list lessons here. Psalm 10 and 4. And Psalm 10 and 4 says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So now remember, Cain already had a kind of a look on his face, didn't he? He had an outward expression that showed that his inward part wasn't good. He's angry. I don't know if the outward part was anger or de dejection or a combination, probably that. But really, again, it's reflecting the inner man that's focused on himself. And so when we get focused on ourselves, it becomes very hard to receive what God has got for us. See, the devil's always trying to get us focused on ourselves, And once we become focused on ourselves, we're not focused on God. If I was focused on God, I wouldn't be thinking about myself so much. Or if I had a focus on God, I might shift to myself, but when God starts to speak, I should shift back to him. Does that make sense? Amen. So again, Proverbs 16 and 18, a very familiar scripture that you hear quoted all the time, and I think we said it even last Wednesday. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Again, that's a spirit that will not receive correction, will not allow themselves to be corrected. They're on, they think that they've got the right way, and they're going to do it that way, and, and they're angry if somebody even challenges them about that. So pride will prevent us from worshiping properly. You know, there's people where God wants them to lift their hands, and they won't. There's people where God wants them to cry, and they won't. There's people where God wants them to just let go, quit being self-conscious, 
but they won't. Because, because of how they may look or what somebody else might say about them. Amen? And, and if we continue in that, I mean, we all find some of those at some point, but if we continue in that, then it prevents us from worshiping. And you've probably heard the stories. I know all of us have probably heard the stories where if somebody says, well, I, I want the Holy Ghost, but I'm not going to cry, you know they're going to cry before you get the Holy Ghost. Well, I want the Holy Ghost, but I'm not going to roll on the floor. You're rolling on the floor if you want the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost, but I'm not going to run and scream. You're going to run and scream if you want the Holy Ghost. Amen, because that's what God's going to do. I've got, he's got to break the thing in us that's the resistance so that we can give him the true worship that God wants us to give. Amen. And so this is how we understand. So, Again, worship must be acceptable to God, and the Lord required a blood sacrifice to cover sin. God said the penalty for sin was death. So the blood of an animal represents the death of that animal. So God allowed a substitute for our death because he knew that if he judged Adam and Eve and took their lives for their sin, they're lost forever because they die in sin. So God in his mercy provides a substitute until the real thing, the blood of Jesus, can come along thousands of years later and can also help the righteous, the just righteous that lived way back then. Because he said, the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to die. So Abel brings of the flock a type of the Lamb of God. Right? The flock is going to be a goat or it's going to be a sheep, but it's a type of the lamb of God. And so what Abel brings already matches God's foreordained purpose. Because the Bible says the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, And so before Adam and Eve sin, God already has got the typology in his mind. So he understands so he's, now he's looking for somebody to demonstrate, and, and Abel demonstrates it by bringing of his flock and the fat thereof. So he didn't just offer it. He, it, was, it died, because when you start talking about the fat, you're taking the best part of the animal, and you're putting it on the altar to burn it. I mean, you can't give the fat without taking the animal apart. So there's, there's death there. So God says... This is the type of worship I want because it points towards what I am going to do. Amen. So he brings of the flock. Again, it's a type of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Bible says Abel offered his sacrifice in faith. Hebrews 11:4 by faith. Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Listen, when you do the right thing, it's going to speak. When you do the right thing, it'll speak beyond your life. Amen. The right thing will speak beyond your life, just like Abel's sacrifice today still speaks to us. So he, he did that sacrifice by faith, the Bible says. Again, we don't have a record where Adam and Eve came to Cain and Abel and said, when you offer up a sacrifice, you need to offer up an animal and it needs to be a blood sacrifice. But what we do know is that God had killed some animals to give skins for covering for Adam and Eve. And there's a good chance that both Cain and Abel had heard that story and Abel may have reasoned something like this. If I offer up an animal, maybe it'll cover my sins. If God took an animal or animals to cover my parents' sins, maybe if I offer up an animal to God, it'll cover my sins. We've done the same thing. We looked in the Bible and we read a scripture. God impresses and we think, if I do that, maybe God will respond to me the same way. If I pray in sincerity, maybe God will talk to me. If I seek God like others that have sought him, maybe I'll find God. 
Amen. So it could be, and I, I kind of believe that, you know, that he had heard the story, and he believed that if I do by faith what God did for my parents, it'll work for me. Praise God. That's how I got baptized. That's how I got the Holy Ghost. If I do by faith what they've been doing, I'll get the same thing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Beginning of worship. Again, worship must be acceptable to God. The Bible says traditions can make our worship empty and useless. So when traditions counteract or prevent the word of God from doing what it's supposed to do, it'll make our worship empty. Empty. Look over in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Jesus speaking, he says, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied, Thou hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And again, we've all been in services where we've heard people say things and pray and we knew that their heart wasn't in it. It was an automatic kind of a thing that was going on. We've all been in those kinds of situations. Amen. And he said, Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Amen. We can't rely upon the commandments of men. We've got to rely upon the word of God. Again, so many today, so many today are, are bound up in traditions, and they go to church. It's no wonder that people drop out of church. A lot of times it's the institution that they've really got their faith in and not the God of the institution. And that's why they drop out when the institution does something wrong or the leaders of the institution become immoral. They drop out because their faith wasn't really in God. It was in the institution, the denomination. You see, if your faith is in God, you know people will fail, but that doesn't change the truth or the God of the truth. Amen. And so you continue to worship God. You might have to find a different place to worship or group, but you don't let go of God. You don't quit go, you know, doing the things of God because your faith is not in the institution, but your faith is in the God of the institution. Praise God. So traditions, and again, we can all think in our mind of different situations where people have traditions in their lives that are preventing them from really receiving or touching God, and they go to service week after week or year after year, and they've done it for years, and they wonder where is God, but it's because they're worshiping by traditions rather than from their heart. Amen to God. Again, the Bible says we must worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. So when we worship God, there's got to be spirit and truth. Now, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the spirit, so God wasn't expecting the same thing of them. But Jesus in the New Testament says the hour is, and now it's come, the hour is coming and now is, when all true worshipers are going to worship in spirit and truth. So in this New Testament age, we need to worship in spirit, and truth. So I need to approach God with truth. I need to approach God with the word of God. I need to approach God according to the word of God. But not only that, I need to approach God by the spirit of God. I need the Holy Ghost to help me worship. Just like we need the Holy Ghost to help us in prayer, we need the Holy Ghost to help us in worship. Amen. So you know, we look in Romans 8 and 14, they that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Sometimes we've got to let God lead us on how to worship in order to give the sacrifice God wants us to give. Amen. Sometimes he just wants a loud praise. Sometimes he just wants us to thank him. Sometimes he wants us to be rambunctious. Sometimes he wants us to be quiet. Sometimes he wants all of those in a certain order throughout a service, but we've got to listen to God when to do that. Again, we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit itself makes intercession. I'm going to say we don't know how to worship sometimes, but we need the Spirit of God in us to guide us in our worship. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. And again, it can be an individual thing. Everybody else can be in quiet, but God says, you need to break through. You need to shout. Nobody else is shout, but God says, you need to shout. Hallelujah. You need the spirit to lead you in the worship. Amen. You're here. Everybody else is doing something else, but God says, you need to stand up. Lift up your hands and open your mouth and praise me. Hallelujah. Praise God. You need to get out of your pew and start walking around and, and, and pretend you're walking around Jericho until the walls of your situation crumble before you and you've got the victory that God has said you could have. Amen. And so we need the spirit of God to lead us into worship. Amen. Again, the Bible says we've got to bring spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. So again, God accepted Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's. That lets us understand that God does not accept anything, even if it's the best we've got to offer. Sometimes we've got to figure out what God wants from us. Amen. So Romans 12 and 1, again, talking about worship. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. See, acceptable unto God. A sacrifice acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And again, present your bodies a living sacrifice. What, is that, what does that mean? That means you're willing to do whatever you need to do to live for God. That's what that means. So a lot of people, they can't worship because they'll come in. They like the feeling of the presence of God. They like to see the move of the Spirit. They like to hear the gifts and they like all that stuff. They like that stuff. But they personally cannot get worship going on their own because they won't present themselves a living sacrifice. Praise God. If I'll present myself a living sacrifice, in other words, here I am, God. I, I want what you want. I'll do what you want. And when you decide that and you offer that to God, I guarantee you, God's going to enjoy it. God's going to find that an acceptable sacrifice. Notice 2 Corinthians 2.15. Second Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. You know, when you look in the Old Testament, the sweet savor is God responding to worship, the sacrifice of worship. When Noah comes out of the ark and he offers up the sacrifice, it's a sweet savor unto God. In the book of Leviticus, where God is giving instructions on Here's how you do a burnt offering. Here's how you do a meat offering. Here's how you do a sin offering. Here's how you do a trespass offering. He says, and you offer up so much drink offering with it, and you offer this part, and you do that, so that it'll be a sweet savor, sweet-smelling savor. When we offer up ourselves to God, it's a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And again, we've got the sacrifice of praise that we give to the Lord. Hebrews 13 and 15. Hebrews 13, 15. By him, Jesus, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So praise, sincere praise, is a sacrifice that God accepts. When we give that with thanks and we start to praise God, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. Thank you, Lord, for your promises and your blessings. Lord, I praise you and I thank you. Amen. It starts to become a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. That's why it's important to open our mouth when we pray and when we worship God. Amen. If we'll open our mouth, amen, that's part of that, giving thanks to God. 
Amen. Giving thanks to God. Hallelujah. Giving our voice. Amen. With our voice, thanking him and praising him. Amen. From the inner person. And again, in 1 Peter 2 and 9, we're called to be priests that so we're supposed to offer up spiritual sacrifices. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're supposed to show forth praises. That's spiritual sacrifice. Amen? So worship must be acceptable to God. God wants worship from us. Amen? And you know, sometimes what makes it the most acceptable is when we don't feel like it, but we say, I'm going to do it anyways. We're tired. We're discouraged. It's been a bad day. We feel like we failed God. But we decide, I, I might not have done as good as God wanted me to do today. I might have slipped, might have done that. But God is still worthy of my praise. He is still God. He's still done wonderful things for me. I might not measure up, but he didn't quit being who he was. And the things that he did for me didn't go away because I didn't do the right thing. Amen. I'm still going to give him some praise. And sometimes when you decide to do that, God comes in like a mighty rushing wind into your situation. Amen. Praise God. Again, the, the, the concept of blood sacrifice has continued through the book of Genesis. The Lord tells Noah, bring seven pairs of all, unclean, of all clean animals on, into the ark and one pair of unclean in Genesis 7, 2, and 3. When Noah leaves the ark, the first thing that he does is build an altar and sacrifice some of those clean animals. This is the first place an altar is actually mentioned. It doesn't mention the word altar with Cain and Abel, but it's implied by the context of what's going on that they've got some kind of an altar that they're making their offering up there, their sacrifice there. So Noah takes those clean animals. The Bible says that Noah's sacrifice is acceptable to the Lord, a sweet-smelling savor. Amen. God smells it and says, I like that. Amen. I like the smell. Why? It's not because of the physical smell. It's because you are offering to me what I want. You are giving me the honor that I want. Because of that, I like that. That smells good to me. Amen. That is pleasing to me. Again, when we worship properly, as I've already mentioned, it's a sweet savor to the Lord. And again, Leviticus 1 and 9, 13, 17, on through there. And I quit listing them because there were so many. They're in Exodus and different places. Amen. But when you do it, what's, what's the book of Leviticus trying to say? If you do it the way I say, It'll be a sweet smell and savor. If your heart is right and you're doing it because you want to worship me, just because you want to worship me doesn't mean you can do it any old way. If you want to worship me, you still need to do it the way I say. But if your heart is right and you want to worship and you'll do it the way I say, it will be a sweet-smelling savor unto me. God will come down in the midst of that sacrifice. You will experience the presence of God. And honestly, that's how people get the Holy Ghost. See, that's really it. People get the Holy Ghost because they say, they realize, I've got to have them. Here I am, God. Whatever I need to do. If I got to talk funny, I'll do it. If I got to cry, I'll do it. If I got to run, I'll do it. If I got to roll, I'll do it. I got to have you, God. I got to have you. And when we start to offer that up, it's a sweet-smelling savor, and poof, God comes down on the sacrifice. Amen. That's why it's hard for some people to get the Holy Ghost. They don't realize that you've got to empty out. I've got to empty out. I can't join. It's not a list of requirements I check off, but it's me becoming what God wants me to become. Amen. Praise God. Again, Psalm 22 and 3, that God inhabits the praises of Israel. And the church is a type of Israel. The church is not Israel, but it's a type of Israel. 
Amen. And so when we praise the Lord, when we start to really worship God the way we ought to worship God, God starts to come and dwell and sit in the midst of his people. And again, it says he inhabits. That word really means he's enthroned. Our praise creates a spiritual throne for God to sit in. When we really praise and worship God, we are constructing a spiritual throne. Amen. And God says, I want to sit in that. God comes and sits in the midst of his people, and we, ex we ex experience the beauty of what God has got for us in his presence. Amen. Again, we're talking about worship in, in the book of Genesis. So many principles that we find in there. When we look at Abraham, Abraham is a man of altars more than anybody else in the Old Testament or in the book of Genesis, we should say. He's a man of altars. So when Abraham gets to the land of Canaan, when he finally obeys what God has asked him to do, the Bible says that God appears to Abraham, says, this is the land I'm going to give you, and I'm going to do what I said. And the first thing Abraham does is he builds an altar unto God. In other words, i got to have a place. I'm going to have a place to worship God. Amen. So he builds an altar. When Abraham moves, after he moves from that place where that altar is, he moves between Bethel and Ai, and he builds another altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. In other words, Abraham's saying, wherever I am in this land, I need to have an altar for God. I need to have a place where I can worship God. Worship not just for Sunday. I need an altar where I live. I need a place where I live that I can worship God. Amen. We've got to have a place in our lives where we worship the Lord. Amen. There's got to be a place. It's not just the church. Yes, we come here and worship as a body, and this is a special place sanctified for God. But in our personal lives, there needs to be a place where we worship God. And, and when I say place, I'm not talking so much about the bedroom or the study or room, but, but it's, a, it's a place in our house. It's a way of thinking in our mind that we've got a place. When we're at home, we've got, we're going to worship God. We're not leaving worship for church on church occasions, but we want to worship God anyways. Amen. You ever wake up in the night and you start to pray to God? Amen. You start to think about scriptures before you go back to sleep. Amen, and, and so you're, you're worshiping God, amen. You wake up in the night, and you can either lay there, or you can start to think about scriptures and talk to God, amen, and worship him in the midnight hour. Praise God. Hallelujah. So when the Lord makes a covenant, finally, in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham for the land. And when Abraham says, how am I going to know this, because I'm childless, and the one that's going to get everything in my house is my steward. God says, get certain kinds of animals. Get a heifer, get a ram, get, you know, get another a goat, a she-goat, get a pigeon, you know, get another kind of a bird or you know, a dove, get those doves and bring them out. So God notice that when God wants to make a covenant, he tells them this is what you need to bring for a sacrifice, not what you think. See, again, sometimes we don't experience the relationship God wants us to have because we're not bringing what he wants us to bring. We're not bringing the thing he's asking us to bring. If I want covenant relationship with God, I've got to do it his way. Amen. But covenant relationship gives me a guarantee. If I'll do it his way when I'm worshiping, God will be there for whatever I need him, for whatever I need him for. Amen. If you covenant with God to do it his way, God will agree with you, and he'll be there. And when the devil comes in, he'll say, no, 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 no. They got a covenant with me. You got to come through me first. You got to go through me. You can't get to them unless you go through me. Praise God. Amen. One man, a story, backslid in the, in the Air Force, 
ready to go to, to Turkey. Ready to go to Turkey. Amen. Backslid in the Air Force in, in, in a kind of a secret service kind of a situation. And all of a sudden, as he's getting ready to leave, one of the officers comes up and says, we don't know why this happened. This never happens. But you're not going to Turkey. You're going to Germany. His mother prayed. And when he got to Germany, an apostolic picked him up and prayed him through back to the Holy Ghost. Oh, when you got covenant relationship with God, God is going to hear and answer some prayers. But in order to have covenant, I've got to do it his way. I've got to do it his way. Praise God. So when Abraham offers Isaac, again, it's a blood sacrifice. Amen, that we see offered. Abraham knows that God is asking him to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. He understands that. So Abraham's offering Isaac as a type of Christ being offered because Isaac's the obedient son. He doesn't wrestle with Abraham and say, no, you're not putting me on the altar, you're not doing that. We don't see any con contests with Isaac. He accepts what Abraham's going to do. And so that's Jesus accepting the will of the Father to be a sacrifice for us. Jesus is the obedient son. He says, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Again, in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And, being, and now, now that he's learned that obedience, he's become the author of salvation unto all them that obey him. So Jesus is the son, he's the obedient son, but he's also the son of promise, which is what Isaac was. He was the son of promise, a miracle son from a mother that was 90 years old that had never had a child, a miracle son, the son of promise. Amen. Jesus is the son of promise. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted, God with us. And again, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David to establish it. Oh, let's praise God a moment. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord God. We give you the glory and the honor, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's the son of promise. Amen. And again, Abraham prophetically says, when Isaac says, where's the lamb? See, Abraham's trained Isaac the right way. When you're going to give a sacrifice, when you're going to worship, there's going to be a lamb. There's going to be an offering that you're going to put there. Isaac says, here's the fire, here's the wood, where's the lamb? So he knows something's supposed to be there. So Abraham's trained him right. But Abraham's got faith in God. He says, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. In other words, God will be that sacrifice eventually when the right time comes. God will provide himself as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. And so when Abraham does what he's been asked to do by God, God stops him and God provides another substitute. You see, again, you're seeing the doctrine of substitution where God is allowing something else to be put in our place. Amen. For our sins. God provides that ram. So this shows that God would provide that substitute, John 1, Behold the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world, John 3, 16. God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but you know, the world through him might be saved. Again, when we come to Isaac, Isaac builds an altar. God appears to Isaac. When God appears to Isaac to confirm the covenant, that he'd made with Abraham. God had made that covenant with Abraham. Isaac's the promised son. But Isaac doesn't have a promise yet from, from Abraham, from God personally. But eventually, 
there comes a day where he's going to go into the land, he, uh, land of the Philistines, and God appears to him and says, I'm going to maintain that covenant that I made with your father. And what does Isaac do? He builds an altar and worships God. Amen. Again, Jacob, when he returns from Padanaram, 20 years plus, running from his brother Esau, and he comes back into the land of Canaan, one of the first things that Jacob does is he builds an altar. But the thing there is that he's not where he needs to be with God. Even though he's back in the land, he's not where he needs to be. And God finally says to him, after Levi and Simeon slay all the men of Shechem being deceitful, and now they're afraid of all the people around them, God says to Jacob, get back to Bethel. Get back to where you first worship God that said he'd be with you. So Jacob goes back to Bethel in, in Genesis 3.51, and God says, build an altar there. And he builds an altar again. So we're seeing that altars. So Jacob calls the altar, he calls it El Bethel, which means the, the God of the house of God. In other words, he's got an altar right there where God has, has really appeared to him and spoke to him the first time. We're talking about Worship in the book of Genesis. Amen. Now, that's really the last time you see an altar in the book of Genesis. So we don't see any more altars till we get to the book of Exodus. Amen. But you see, there's a, there's a pattern. There's a pattern right from Cain and Abel all the way through. You know, we have all, all the patriarchs here. Abraham's got altars. Isaac's got an altar. Jacob's got some altars. Amen. Altars are important. Altars represent worship. But just because we, there's an altar, we still need to offer up the proper sacrifice. Okay, Genesis also records the beginning of prayer, which we talked about last week in Genesis 4.26. When Seth has a son, Enos, the Bible says men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. So if you add this up, Adam's 130 years old when Seth is born. And Seth is 105 years old when Enos is born. So this is 235 years after the beginning of the creation before they start praying. So we don't know what has happened. You know, if the violence is starting to, you know, increase in the world. We don't know if the population has expanded to the point that, remember that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and he went east of Eden to the land of Nod. So it appears that there was an area where Adam and Eve and their first offspring lived that God's presence was there, even though it wasn't the Garden of Eden. But now Cain goes out from the presence of God or the face of God, and now men begin to multiply. It might be that they outgrew that area. I don't, we don't know. But it's at that point, 235 years afterwards, they start to pray and call upon the name of of the Lord. Amen. And so this is the beginning of prayer. So Genesis teaches us we need to pray, we need to worship, we need to worship the right way. Amen. Amen. So let's just try to summarize well, some of the things we've talked about here. So again, Genesis shows the beginning of worship and prayer to God. Worship included a blood sacrifice of an animal. Okay, now Jesus is our blood sacrifice. But, but we apply the blood when we obey the plan of salvation. See, so again, sometimes people won't offer the right sacrifice. Brother Tim was talking about it the other night at our class, how many people that he's talked to, they see it, but they don't want to do the right thing. They don't want to put the right thing on the altar because they might be rejected, their family might not understand, they might have to change their denomination or where they go to church. They might be ridiculed as a heretic. You've got to be willing to do it what God says, regardless of what others are going to say. Amen. And again, the worship it foreshadowed the doctrine of substitution and the Lamb of God. Worship needs to be acceptable to the Lord. So again, we got at least three examples there. 
Cain's offerings rejected because it's not right. Noah had to offer the clean animals. If he'd offered the unclean ones, it would not have been a sweet-smelling savor to God. But God said, two of every kind, but when you get the clean animals, seven pairs of those. Why? Because God was... God wanted certain types of sacrifices to be offered when he came out of the ark. And Noah offers those. Abraham's given specific animals in Genesis 15 for a covenant relationship. How shall I know this? Get a heifer three years old, get a ram three years old, get a she-goat three years old, get a pigeon, get a turtle dove, amen. Split the animals, but don't split the, the birds, amen. So God tells them, if you want a covenant relationship, you want to know, this is what you need to do. Amen. Again, so worship foreshadowed the, the Lord as our sacrifice, and worship is foundational to our relationship with God. Amen. So there, there's quite a bit in Genesis when we start to look at worship, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if you thought about a whole bunch of things I didn't even say that, you, that, that are in the book of Genesis. But the point is, is, again, there's a lot of principles there. The book of Genesis is jam-packed full of things that are important to us as believers. Amen. Let's stand here tonight. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, that you've left us a record that we can understand and know. Lord, that you show us attitudes that are acceptable and attitudes that are not, that any kind of worship is not what you will accept, but there's things that you want from us. But Lord, you've given us the words so we can know how to serve you, know how to approach you, know how to have relationship with you. Help us to understand, Lord, true worship in spirit and in truth, Lord God, because worship is foundational to our relationship with you, we pray. Give us understanding in your name, in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Say, I'm going to worship God's way. Amen.